So good afternoon, everyone. Let's see if we could get also this session, as has become the tradition here, to start on time. So if you could take your seats, you are ready to come and listen here to a session under the heading Sochi 2014, Winter Games with a Political Touch. Well, I don't know if there is anyone in this room who has the illusions that we can have such a thing as Olympic Games without a political touch, regardless of where they are being organized, in Sochi or elsewhere. We touched on Rio earlier today, for instance, and some of the issues that seem to be involved there. Well, it's a bit of this good news, bad news si situation that I'd have to start with. The good news is that we have four speakers who I, w I think you will find it very interesting to listen to here as they get their turn. The bad news is that we are m missing a couple of the planned speakers. We had one more ra Russian representative, namely from Transparency International, and we had someone who would have been on the plane with me uh, from Washington with particular expertise in ethnic issues and the link to uh, the threats of terrorism, et, et cetera. But for last minute family emergencies, both of them are missing without any replacement. Now that means that the good news in a sense is that the burden is on you in the audience here to make sure that we get the full spectrum of questions related to Sochi covered here when it gets time for you to step in with your questions. The uh, four speakers, of course, have their focus uh, set and, and I don't think can be expected to sort of, in that sense, uh, make up for the two who are not coming, but in many ways, I think you would be able to do so. Now, the bad news, apropos that, good news is that you first might have to listen to me for a few min more minutes because I agreed with Jens Sayer that without sort of any biases in terms of suggesting problems or even less solutions that I would give just a quick overview of what are some of the issues that have come up uh, since, first of all, it was decided that back in 2007 that Sochi w would be the host of next year's Olympics and also little by little as we have seen the preparations and is issues emerging. I think many of us, well I'd somehow read at, at some point I remember that Stalin had a favorite summer place in Sochi but that was about all that I knew about the place and I think many in the room probably had to look on the map to l locate it. Of course it's absolutely natural that Russia gets to host the Winter Olympics with sort of st strong traditions in all the sports involved. But uh, of course the precise choice of Sochi uh, uh, is may what may have raised some issues in itself. I was asking for instance our colleagues from Russia where pre precisely does the torch relay happen to be today? And of course they answered Murmansk which perhaps would sound more like a, w a, w a winter uh, location rather than a place that is a summer resort on the Black Sea, but of course as they convinced me, Murmansk would be too cold if, if Sochi perhaps is on the warm side for the hosting the Winter Olympics. Now, uh, of course Sochi, uh, or whenever we talk about uh, hosting the Olympics in some place, there is always the issue trying to convince the IOC that a lot of the facilities are already in place. That's one of the arguments that not so much new, uh, new has to be built and so on. And of course, in the case of Sochi, it's probably the other way around. Basically, everything has to be built from scratch in terms of arenas, facilities, and the sufficient uh, f facilities for all the visitors. And not just that, but even the infrastructure, r roads, railways, and in terms of power, uh, telecommunications, and so on. Now, of course, that gives opportunities because we have heard about a positive aspect that this will be the most compact game uh, ever with one coastal cluster and one mountain cluster and very convenient for both athletes and spectators. But it does mean that there has been an absolute rat race, if you put it that way, in terms of a timetable because even if they're highly positioned, I, th I don't think it would be uh, viable for 
Mr. Putin to call Mr. Bach and say, well, very sorry, but could we postpone the start with a few weeks because we are not quite ready. And clearly it is a matter of prestige that everything not just will be ready, but in perfect shape to receive the participants. And that has meant a vast project, uh, in, in even by Olympic standards. And what always happens then, you have cost estimates, you get cost overruns, some of them are natural and typical wherever you have the event. But in this kind of situation where so much has to be constructed, so much has to be prepared from scratch, it's perhaps still a bit astonishing when you hear numbers such as seven times the original uh, estimates. And of course, immediately the questions, suspicions come up. Where has all that money gone? Has it really been because of more expensive construction or has it gone into the pockets of politicians or, or uh, construction companies? S a situation not unknown from any other uh, uh, Olympic games or major events. Also, the lo location in uh, other ways. There are even specific things such as the neighbor relations with Georgia having led to talks about possible boycott by uh, uh, Georgia over the tensions in relations between the two countries. M more historic aspects. Some people have said, well, gosh, don't they realize that uh, the Sochi area is the site of one of the worst genocides that we know of going back to the 1800s where the Russian Empire er, uh, basically uh, sent the Circassian and, and, and so were the or original residents in the area at the time packing. And in the process, the, 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 there are some ras rather nasty sto stories. So people question on those simple grounds. Now, it's also a location that compared with many others, we know these days we are not basically safe anywhere when it comes to terrorist threats. But people then say, well, how could it, uh, could it really be a smart move to put the Olympic Games so close to areas which are known to be the home ground of, of terrorist groups? And we got a reminder in an uh, incident in Volgograd quite recently. Of course, people say then, well, we surely trust the Russians that is to provide all the security that uh, is needed. But then comes, just as we heard apropos Rio earlier today, well, what's the other side of that coin? What kind of atmosphere will that bring in terms of, of all the resources, installations, uh, security that would be needed to provide any measure of guarantee? And of course, that leads also to related issues of freedom of press and supervision, sur surveillance that, uh, and also for that matter, for those who are actually participating or vi visiting the games. If you combine that with the, the existing concerns about restrictions on the participants from IOC's end regarding their freedom to express themselves and use m m media during the event. Of course, a special issue that was particularly highlighted during the uh, recent track and field world championship, R Russia anti-gay laws, where of course we have seen then seen IOC in, shall we say, some of the fumbling, stumbling ways grapple with this issue, of course saying that these laws are not in any way in, in conflict with the Olympic Charter, but uh, perhaps ducking the issue if they have any other practical implications for those who will participate in the game or visit during the game. So in other words, as the torch re uh, relay continues on its way here, the longest one ever, it a little bit has been under this cloud of sort of some doubts or worries and, and issues where some things may be rumors, some may be more founded in reality, and where we hope that the speakers today may be able to shed light on some of those issues and other questions that you will have. So with that, I'll stop speaking and instead we'll get the first of our panel uh, to the podium. I think Andrea Selios doesn't need in Play the Game Circle much in an in introduction. Norwegian-based researcher and blogger who, who's writing I myself uh, in, enjoy quite often and from a Norwegian perspective but with a strong international outlook and focus on Olympics often and 
with his background in international law, I think he is someone who will fit in under this topic very nicely. So welcome up, Andreas. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I think it's an understatement to call the Sochi Olympics uh, a games with a political touch. Uh, I think uh, that uh, the Sochi Winter Olympics will be the most political winter games ever. Uh, in this talk, uh, I will address some of the political controversies we may expect to take place before and during the Olympics in Sochi. And uh, what I will do is uh, to show you that since the introduction of the modern Olympic Games and until today, there has been a shift in Olympic protests from geopolitics to civil protests. However, the Games in Sochi may change this picture. I've changed the title a little bit from the program, but I hope you can bear with that. And I think there is a danger, a real danger, that geopolitics will be reintroduced to the games in Sochi. Uh, I will also show you that there has been a turn in the strategy of human rights organizations and their use of the Olympics as an arena to shame the host countries. To illustrate this, uh, I'll share with you a case study I've conducted together with a colleague in Norway on Norwegian human rights organizations uh, and their campaign during the Beijing Olympics. This turn in strategy falls in line with my claim that geopolitics are reintroduced to the Olympics next year. So I will uh, make this talk in three sections. First, I will just have take, a, uh, take you through a brief look at the, the, the development of Olympic protests since the beginning of the Olympics. Then I will share some of the findings in the study that uh, we have done in Norway on uh, NGOs, human rights organizations. And then I will elaborate a little bit about what we can uh, expect from the Sochi Olympics. First, here is a chart which so show uh, uh, the, the protests since 1896 until uh, Beijing Olympics. And we can see from this chart that summer games have been uh, more prone to protests than winter games. In the, in the, to put it uh, uh, in different words, summer games have until now been more political than winter games. Here we see a table uh, where we have, uh, where Cottrell and uh, Nelson have uh, uh, categorized uh, types of political protests since the beginning of the Olympics until today, we see two, uh, two developments. First, we have gone from a period of bans and boycotts to uh, civil demonstrations since the beginning and until now. Second, we see that it has been a great increase in civil uh, demonstrations uh, in the just the last 10, 15 years. So that is uh, the, 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 the background for, for uh, discussing what I'm discussing now. So let's go over to the Norwegian case. In Norway in 2009, me and my colleague, we interviewed eight human rights organizations and asked them about their experience with the Beijing Olympic Games. We categorized the, the human rights organizations into three categories. One we call the generalists, which is Amnesty International, the Helsinki Committee, uh, which are organizations who uh, fight for human rights all over the world and all kinds of human rights. Second, we, 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 we categorized uh, organizations uh, as um, regional organizations, organizations that only uh, cared about what was happening inside China or on the borders. And thirdly, we, we, we had one group we called niche organizations, like uh, the Norwegian Union of Journalists and the Norwegian PEN, who uh, only focuses on the, the role of the journalists and the role of the, 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 the writers and so on. 
So we interviewed eight organizations. We did the same uh, with uh, five other organizations in two uh, this year, in fact, when we asked them four years after what were their experience, were they still of the same opinion as they, they had in, in, in 2009? And I can come back to that. What is very interesting here is many things, of course. First, we asked them if they wanted the Olympics to China. Six of the organizations, they wanted the, the, the Olympics to China because then they could put uh, pressure on China and they could uh, uh, get attention to all the human rights violations there. The only organizations who did not want the Olympics there was the regional uh, organizations, they, the organizations that uh, had an interest in the region, the, the Thai Beat uh, Committee and the Burma, uh, the Burma Committee. No, sorry, Network for Human Rights in China. Second, we asked, did you take advantage of the Olympics? And they said, of course, this is a great opportunity for us to highlight all the uh, human rights violations in, in China. Then we asked, did the Olympics in China help human rights in China? All of them said, no. The Olympics uh, uh, started a uh, uh, series of uh, uh, more violations and the situation got worsened. All of them said that because of the Olympics. Second, or no, uh, fourth, sorry, very happy with the campaign. Yes, it was a success. Even if they thought that the situation got worse, they said that they were happy with the campaign. Very much because they increased the membership of their own organizations and they got increased attention to their own organizations and not only to the human rights violations in China. And lastly, Will you campaign again before Olympics, for instance, Sochi? And everybody said yes. So most of the organizations here, except for those where who were engaged in the, uh, in the region around or inside China, they will use Sochi as an opportunity to put pressure on the Russian government. But they have changed strategy a little bit because what they did before the Beijing Olympics was that the organization themselves put pressure on the government. They confronted the Chinese government uh, with uh, all the accusations. No, they say is told us this year that it was a failed strategy because uh, the Chinese government gets so pissed out, uh, because of that, so they just put up their guard and uh, uh, introduced countermeasures. So the new strategy now is to engage sponsors or confront sponsors, confront governments outside Russia so that they should put pressure on uh, Russia, for instance, or other countries, and thirdly, nor, uh, national Olympic committees. So they will, will be more confrontational towards national Olympic committees going to Russia and not only pressure on the government of Russia. That was their new. And of course, this is the Norwegian case, but uh, I guess that some of these findings can also be, uh, be relevant for other countries. Amnesty, for instance, is not a Norwegian organization. Their campaigning is... Uh, is uh, is ruled from London or some other places. Okay, so what can we expect uh, uh, before the Sochi Olympics? I split this into uh, different levels of uh, conflict or geopolitics, because first we have Russia as a superpower. They are engaging in, the, the in Syria, for instance, not engaging in Syria, but they have uh, different opinions in the UN Security Council than, for instance, US and France. And how does this affect the Sochi Olympics? It affects Sochi Olympics in different ways. First, every country since the Lillehammer Olympics in 94 has adopted a resolution in the UN called the Olympic Truce. 
London Olympics were the first uh, Olympics where all the UN countries signed the resolution. Each uh, uh, Olympic res resolution since 1993 has been introduced one year before the Olympics. So we should expect that Sochi would uh, uh, propose this resolution in February this year, but they did not. It's supposed to be promoted on uh, uh, in the 6th of November in one week. And because it's so close to the Olympics, then we can expect that many uh, countries will use that as an opportunity to protest against Russia. What happened, for instance, be before the Beijing Olympics was that eight countries did not sign the resolution because they wanted independence for Taiwan. So we may e expect that this is a great opportunity to signal uh, the dissatisfaction uh, with Russian politics in the UN. Also, uh, Christer mentioned the Circassians in uh, the Adyghia region, in uh, where Sochi is uh, situated. The Circassians in that region, in Sochi region, uh, it's not the Sochi region, but I call it the Sochi region, so everybody understand. Uh, they want independence, like Chechens and other, other groups. And uh, they have used the Sochi Olympics as a great opportunity to promote their cause. But also, a lot of Circassians are living in Syria. And the Circassians in Sochi, they want the Circassians in Syria back to Russia to save them from war and want the Russian government to give them citizenship. And the Russian government, has, uh, uh, they have res refused this, at least until recently. So there you have a combination between a regional conflict inside Russia and Russia as a superpower. Uh, of course, uh, I could also mention uh, terrorism. I had that on the my former uh, PowerPoint. Terrorism is also uh, can be a part of this. I'm not sure if the Circassians use the same tactics as the Chechens or Ingusets or uh, Dagestanis or, 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 or uh, groups like that. But very many groups like Al-Qaeda, they will use the opportunity to support all kinds of independent, uh, independent organizations there. Maybe, probably, can be. Uh, and use this as an opportunity to fight for their cause. And uh, Christa also mentioned ge uh, ge uh, Georgia. Georgia and Russia and the Olympic truce is a strange, strange history. Ge uh, under the opening ceremony in Beijing Olympics, Russia and G uh, Georgia went to war. And this conflict is still going on, not like war, but, uh, uh, but uh, strong political rhetoric. Uh, and there has been some controversies between Russia and Georgia because of the Sochi Olympics. And then, uh, so, and, and all the human rights organizations, they can also jump on these issues. Third, Russia can be a target for the activists or the NGOs that I referred to uh, previously. We have already seen the anti-gay law protests, and this will only be one of the issues, I guess, that we, uh, the Russian uh, government and Russia will be confronted with. And lastly, uh, I have to admit, and I'm sorry to say, that Norway is a winter superpower. And different from Beijing Olympics, Norway has a bigger saying in this Olympics than four years ago. So uh, the, the NGOs that I was referring to previously, they have said that they will use Norway as a broker for better human rights in Sochi because we get a lot of attention because we are a superpower in Winter Olympics. So uh, the Norwegian Olympic Committee and, uh, and uh, sponsors of the Norwegian athletes and the Norwegian athletes, 
they can uh, prepare for more pressure from NGOs than previously. And this will also uh, have bearings on how the Norwegian government is approaching Russia just before uh, Sochi and uh, during Sochi. So what we see here is that uh, the, the activists that uh, used uh, Olympics as an arena uh, before, they have changed tactics. So now the activism will uh, look more like f uh, former times when geopolitics and boycotts and bans were, were uh, more prevalent. I'm getting the, the yellow card here from the handball uh <laughs> referee, so I say thank you for your attention, and I can, I'm happy to answer questions in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andreas, for uh, delving into some of those issues that undoubtedly will be some among the more intriguing or perhaps worrisome ones as we get closer. Our next speaker is Alexei Konov. He is the head of the anti-corruption division of the Russia's G20 Exp Expert Council. I think most of you in the room are aware that not so many months ago, there was a G20 summit in St. Petersburg. And in the uh, preparations for that summit, one of the many topics that was singled out for special focus for proposals and deci decision making during the summit was precisely anti-corruption and it was handled by a particular working group. Of course, anti-corruption tends to emanate more from areas such as economics and trade and business. But what's interesting here is that explicitly was included also sports and cultural events. And in fact, uh, uh, originating from these efforts is a proposal that came up in connection with the summit for what has been referred to as a global alliance for integrity in sports. So, with uh, those explanations, I welcome Mr. Konov to the podium. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to speak here. I believe it's actually the first time when uh, G20 people take part in this conference. So, thank you for inviting. Uh, I'd like to make a certain clarification from the very beginning. I'm not a government official from Russia. I'm just an expert working for the Russian government, and I'm working not on Sochi 2014, but on the Russian G20 presidency agenda. So probably I cannot satisfy all your interest in Sochi 2014. Uh, what I can is uh, to describe in brief the Russian G20 presidency initiatives in uh, uh, combating corruption in sports and the Russian proposals that were put forward this year. So let me start with a very brief outline of the anti-corruption process within the G20 and then move directly to this global alliance initiative that our Mr. Chairman has already mentioned. As you may know, uh, the G20 has uh, implemented the anti-corruption agenda since uh, 2010 and the anti-corruption agenda of the G20 is defied first, defined first of all in the leader statement and then in more details in uh, uh, two-year anti-corruption action plans. We are now in the middle of implementation of the second anti-corruption action plan, the action plan for 2013-2014. Uh, so it's quite an ambitious document comprising many different anti-corruption measures, over 35 of them actually. So the main focus of the G20 with regard to anti-corruption is the on the implementation of this anti-corruption action plan. And to ensure the implementation of the leaders' commitments and to ensure the implementation of the action plans, uh, the G20 anti-corruption working group, uh, the so-called ACWG, was established also in 2010. Uh, and actually, I was uh, a part of this group for this year. 
In addition to this action plan, to the G20 and corruption action plan, each presidency in the G20 usually puts forward a number of some new proposals to move the uh, anti-corruption agenda forward, and Russia was no exception. This year we proposed several um, anti-corruption initiatives, several anti-corruption measures, including the one on combating corruption in organizational, sporting, cultural, and other major international events. So it was not uh, precisely and only about uh, sports events, but of course sport events play the most important role here. Uh, there were many reasons for putting forward this initiative, some of them quite general, some of them uh, more specific. Uh, the general reason was that this area has some uh, specific features, specific characteristics that increase its vulner vulnerability to corruption, even compared to some other areas also prone to corruption. Uh, we have already mentioned a uh, matter of prestige, and you all know that being selected to hold a major international event is a matter of a country prestige. So to pressure uh, the pressure to overcome other bidders creates an environment potentially vulnerable and potentially favorable to corruption, and we all understand that. And of course, commitments that any country holding a sporting event, a major sporting event, is taking upon itself, they should be fulfilled no matter how effectively the government funds are being spent. So if the government, for example, the Russian government, knows that any infrastructure site has not been built because the money allocated to the projects was stolen, uh, we have uh, no other choice but to approve additional funds and to get the work done. So we need to continue. We cannot stop this work because of corruption. And it, of course, creates more opportunities for further corruption. And of course, we all understand that in preparation and organization of a major sporting event and major public event, uh, corruption can take place at different stages and in ma very many different forms. From the very beginning, from the bidding process and the interaction with international organizations, to corruption in procurement of infrastructure and equipment, to undue licensing and sponsorship practices, to match fixing, and so on and so forth. So to fight corruption in sports and in other major in uh, international events, a comprehensive system should be developed, a very complex system in fact, that includes multiple and very different remedies. Uh, and that makes uh, combating corruption in sports uh, very difficult. This is actually bad news, there is also a good one, as usual, that the international character of major events gives uh, multilateral international community additional op opportunities to influence the way uh, these events are awarded and organized. Uh, it could be done by different, uh, with different measures, by streamlining bidding procedures, for example, by making uh, international organization and sport international organization more transparent, by setting up relevant procurement licensing and sponsorship standards and so on and so forth. So being in the spotlight of international attention, uh, we can say it, it marks out the organization of sport events compared to certain other corruption prone areas which are primarily dealt with mostly at domestic level. So it's a more kind of international issue. And this is one of the reasons why Russia proposed this topic to be considered by the G20. Uh, there were also some other reasons, more specific ones, uh, to launch this topic within the G20 actually. One of the most important of them was that uh, most of the major international, not most, okay, many of the major international sporting events in recent years have been organized in uh, G20 countries. If we take, for example, the period from 2000 till uh, 2016, uh, we can see that four out of five Summer Olympics were held or will be held in the G20 countries, as well as five out of five Winter Olympics and five out of six FIFA World Cups. So uh, it's quite natural for the G20 to play a leading role in combating corruption in organization of major events, because actually the G20 countries are, in fact, the organizers of these events. And of course, Russia had its own reasons for pushing this topic forward. Uh, the Russia will host the Winter Olympics, the Sochi Winter Olympics in less than 100 days. But we will also host, the, uh, for example, the World Hockey Championship in 2016 and the FIFA World Cup in 2018, so, and, and plenty of other uh, important uh, events, uh, including sporting events and cultural events. So 
uh, we need to understand the best practices in anti-corruption in this field and try to do something about corruption within this area. Um, speaking about the initiatives in fighting corruption in sports, we all know that lots of important initiatives in this field, uh, in this field are now being implemented by international organizations, by business, by civil society, and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, uh, the UNODC and the UNESCO pay a lot of attention to uh, corruption in sports issue. Uh, uh, I think you know that, but uh, actually the UNODC has just recently issued uh, the paper, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, a strategy for safeguarding against corruption in major public events. It's quite a comprehensive uh, and uh, rather big paper, which is uh, quite important. Uh, and uh, actually, you know, DC has some other uh, important projects in this field. You know, DC, as I mentioned, also is active in this area. Uh, there is a very important UN Global Compact initiative where, where uh, many private companies are involved. Of course, there are, there are lots of projects by uh, non-governmental organizations such as Transparency and International Sport Accord and so on and so forth. So there are actually lots of important initiatives in fighting corruption in sports. At national level, uh, increasing attention is also being paid to sports integrity issues. A number of countries, including Russia, including other G20 members, have recently adopted important legislation to promote transparency and accountability in organizing major events. Uh, for example, Australia, who will held, uh, hold the next G20 presidency, has just recently adopted new legislation on combating corruption in sports, I think you know about it, and uh, even established the Sport Integrity Intelligence Unit. So there are lots of in initiatives in this field, uh, and m many of them are quite innovative and I believe practically useful. But there is one serious drawback uh, that we can see that and it's that those initiative are initiatives are quite often somewhat isolated and disintegrated. And people from different projects don't know much about other projects implemented in this area. And the lack of communication and cooperation have some, has some important negative consequences. Uh, first of all, it may lead to duplication of efforts and make it more difficult to take into account relevant experience. Uh, another important consequence is that uh, in the anti-corruption agenda in sports, some topics, uh, for example, match fixing or legal betting or anti-doping, may become unbalanced and become being brought to the forefront, while others, which are no less important, for example, corruption in the bidding process, receive much less attention. Uh, as far as the national legislation on combating corruption in sports is concerned, the issues actually remain absolutely the same. The methods countries apply to tackle corruption and promote integrity differ significantly. However, unlike in certain other anti-corruption regulation areas, the comparative studies on different solutions in the uh, anti-corruption in sports are still very rare and some necessary information resources, for example, different legislation databases are now lacking. So we, we don't have such resources and no international organizations actually is doing such work. So we believe that uh, the time has come to review what is being done in the framework of various projects, compare existing problems, corruption risk areas, put together possible solutions, and try to build common ground for all the stakeholders involved in combating corruption in sports. And actually one of the possible ways of doing this uh, is to set up an umbrella platform for different stakeholders. And um, we propose to create such, to establish such a platform and to call it the Global Alliance for Integrity in Sports. Of course, the title may be different. Uh, it's the, uh, actually the contents of this alliance is more important. Uh, as we envisage it now, the alliance will not be a substitute for existing projects, of course. It will be rather a multilateral forum where governments, business, international, and professional organizations, sports federations, and of course civil society will discuss existing problems, share ideas, maybe uh, launch some joint anti-corruption projects and try to find some strategic solutions and some common ground. Uh, the Global Alliance uh, idea was initially put forward by Russia at the third uh, high-level anti-corruption conference for G20 governments and business. Uh, it was held in April in Paris, in April this year. 
And this proposal was uh, very warmly welcomed by uh, the OECD and the UNODC, and they proposed uh, support for this initiative. In particular, it was agreed to organize a special side event on the margins of the fifth session of the Conference of the State Parties to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption uh, that will take place in Panama in November this year, maybe you know it. Uh, and during this side event, uh, we are going to discuss possible approaches actually to establishing and further developing the alliance. So it's very much work in, in progress. It's very much an idea, actually. But uh, we hope that uh, during this side event, we'll come to some concrete and specific solutions. Uh, speaking a little bit more about the organizational issues, it was an idea that as a basis for the global alliance, uh, a, side, a set of high level principles could be developed. Uh, for example, in the form of some global pledge or some declaration. Uh, the global pledge will be based on the relevant anti-corruption tools and the relevant anti-corruption uh, standards existing in this area, including the UNODC standards, the OD OECD standards, and others. And if we can dream a little bit, uh, to make this pledge operational, certain basic organizational measures could be implemented, for example, an annual Global Alliance Conference, or a special website of the Global Alliance that will um, contain important data on combating corruption in sports, and for example, on uh, anti-corruption legislation in different countries, not only in G20 countries, but in the wide area of countries. Um, so not to receive the red card, uh, I will say the last thing. Uh, it's actually the last moment I'd like to draw attention to. Uh, uh, and it's that regardless of how the process of establishing the global alliance will develop, Russia is going to continue its initiatives within the G20, including the initiative on combating corruption in sports, even when the Russian presidency is over and it's over in, uh, on the 1st of December this year. Uh, in particular, we have already proposed and the G20 ACWG agreed to develop a compendium of best practices in combating corruption in sports at the national level. Uh, so we would like actually to find most interesting solutions adopted by various countries to fight different forms of corruption in sports. And of course, we very much welcome all the possible assistance in this process. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for this presentation. And as Mr. Corner was indicating from the outset, of course, he f uh, focused on one very specific aspect uh, that is of higher relevance as we now focus on what's happening in the preparations for the Sochi Olympics. But on the other hand, he brought our attention a process and proposals that have wider ramifications for us in our interest from the plain the game perspective in anti-corruption. Our next speaker is Dimitri Tugarin. He's someone who started out his career in journalism and then after having been involved also for a period in marketing and public communications, he for instance was editor-in-chief of a, a magazine called My Football. So I think, I think uh, Unlike some of the speakers we had on the FIFA topic this morning, he is, he is someone who, who really is uh, a, a practitioner in that sense. Subsequently, he was appointed advisor to the Russian um, sports minister, and he is now at Ria no Novosti. I would personally, as I happen to draw on that website from time to time, see it as really a major uh, news media outlet if you want to, uh, to follow what's going on in Russia. In the old days, you had a choice between Pravda and Is Isvestia, but now I think with, obviously with the internet, this is an, 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 a medium that gives us very major insights. And in that very major Russian uh, agency that has uh, programs in various other languages and is located also around the world in many places, he is an executive director. So welcome up, Mr. Tugarin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, uh, let me entertain you a little bit. It's a short video about our agency.
Thank you. I hope you were not confused by uh, Russian letters. There were some English texts also in, in video. But maybe some of you, inspired by the Olympic Games in Sochi, will, will learn Russian. So I'll be happy if any of you will succeed, <laughs> succeed in this. Uh, uh, let me be positive. Andreas scared us uh, nearly uh, by some problems that, that uh, the Olympic Games in Sochi will face. Uh, I will not argue to, to every item of this maybe later when we drink beer and, and discuss this. I know that is a rivality between Norway and Russian that uh, talks in him because Norway is uh, always best in, in winter sports. We know that, and but we'll try to, to fight uh, in, in Sochi. So, so I can explain your, your position only by this. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it was a joke, but anyway, I, I'm happy to, uh, to tell you that it's very good reason to meet uh, here today with you because uh, today is exactly uh, 100 days to go to the uh, uh, 22nd Winter Olympic Games in, in Sochi. It's, it's, a, it's a nice day. And uh, there are a lot of things uh, to do in, in uh, Sochi. And, um, but I can assure you that a lot of uh, things uh, had been already done. And uh, due to the media and uh, to the conditions of uh, work for, for media people in Sochi, uh, uh, everybody is planned and everybody is ready. So I'm visiting Sochi uh, nearly uh, every week, so I know how, how things are going. And uh, I'm, mm, I'm really uh, uh, impressed uh, how how much the organizing committee uh, had done in, in during the preparation to uh, to the uh, for the for the Olympic Games. But uh, let me tell you a couple of word, words about about our work in in uh, Sochi. Um, Rio Novosti Rio Novosti was named um, the uh, the official host nation agency for, for the Winter Games. That means that we are uh, obliged to provide every kind of uh, sport information about the performance of, of uh, Russian national team for national media. That is the main task from the International Olympic Committee that uh, uh, delivered us the, the title of the uh, national host agency. And um, that means that the International Olympic Committee uh, is expecting a professional coverage of the, of the performance of national team. Uh, we uh, understand this task, but we do, uh, we do more, really more, and uh, we, we see it as a big challenge for, for, for our uh, media and for, for our agency, and we'll try to, to make our best uh, and to, to to provide the information not only for the national media in Russia, but also for international media. And we are working not just during uh, the, the Olympics, we already started our work. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, events and uh, uh, really important events that, that are happening and we are uh, working with them now. But. Uh, here you see some, some uh, figures about uh, participating of our uh, uh, journalists, reporters, and photographers, and, and uh, editors in, in the Sochi, pro Sochi project. Uh, you also see, you also see uh, the, the list of uh, activities that we'll, we provide. It's, it's also the infographics and the photos, uh, videos, and uh, uh, special events. Uh, the new uh, the new word in in a, in a, uh, in a media it's the panoramic uh, 360 uh, grade uh, videos. 
it's a virtual tour, tour, uh, tours on the Sochi. You can see it, you can find it in on our website, and it's uh, it's really amazing. Uh, uh, new multimedia interactive projects and uh, and a lot of other things. But uh, what I uh, I'd like to uh, to uh, to tell you that the uh, the biggest event that is uh, ongoing now it's the Olympic uh, the Olympic torch relay going now from uh, uh, all over across the uh, the uh, the country uh, across Russia it's the largest uh, torch relay in history uh, it will take um, 123 days and um, it will uh, cover about 65,000 kilometers. Uh, so the torch will be welcomed in uh, three, nearly 3,000 uh, cities and small towns and, and uh, villages of, of the Russian Federation. And uh, uh, our team, team of Rio Novosti, is participating in, in covering of this, uh, of this uh, project. So we have the, the correspondents uh, who are following the torch uh, every day. So you can imagine it's, it's, it's a really great job uh, that is done uh, by the people who, who left their families and, and who left uh, uh, Moscow for, for, for this, uh, this job. Uh, uh, maybe you heard about some, uh, uh, some highlights of, the, of this uh, torch relay. The torch will, be, uh, will visit the uh, already been in the North Pole uh, we'll go down to the bottom of the uh, biggest lake Baikal, go on the top of Mount Everest, and even uh, even uh, uh, the the Olympic uh, torch will be in the open in the open space, and and uh, that the the Russian cosmonauts will will, will uh, do it in the nearest time. So follow follow the news. It's really interesting. Uh, Uh, we uh, were working actively with the uh, social networks, so we have the, the uh, more than one million uh, permanent visitors in uh, Facebook. So it's uh, also uh, it also shows that we are working with the young audience and the, the audience of Rio Novosti getting younger and younger, and uh, a lot of. Uh, and a big, big uh, part of uh, of our audience are very interested in the in the Olympic information, and in everything that that concerns uh, Sochi. Um, well, uh, we have a very special project, a very special project uh, that uh, that uh, uh, concerns. Uh, that that made fulfilled fulfilled the idea of gathering all the uh, Russian sport journalists from all over the country. So we gathered them uh, already three times uh, to discuss uh, all issues of the forthcoming games, every uh, possible um, problems and security uh, matters, and the the professional uh, issues, everything. And uh, that makes uh, Russian media uh, very positive, and, and, and we, we make them feel uh, united and keep them uh, well informed. So, so Ria knows have been uh, have been a kind of uh, uniting uh, unit. Uh, uh, how to say the the link that. The, uh, Connected the people from all over the country, from from far east uh, Siberia and the central part of of Russia. Um, uh, we also took the initiative uh, uh, and and uh, and discussed the uh, very interesting and important item with the National Olympic Committee and with the International Olympic Committee that. Uh, Concerns the extra quote for for uh, Russian uh, regional journalists for, for the journalists who, who are working in in uh, uh, in the media long outside of the European part of of, uh, uh, of Russia. Uh, 
uh, who uh, had no chance to, to, to get a professional accreditation in the, uh, for, for the Olympic Games. So we uh, uh, succeeded to, to pursue the National Olympic Committee and, uh, and with this help uh, we got the extra quote for, for a Russian regional jo sport journalist. Uh, and uh, 30 uh, extra accreditations were provided by the IOC uh, to, to, to media in, in, uh, uh, in uh, Russia's regions to, uh, in, in order to, to cover the games uh, by, by, the, by the media. Uh, so I think that, is, uh, is, uh, that was a uh, good success for us and we do it, uh, did it uh, also uh, like uh, feeling our social responsibility and uh, that was a very positive uh, way of, of uh, acting uh, that, uh, and that was a, a gesture of uh, solidarity for, for, the, for the media in, in, in our country. Um, that is uh, the anticipated results of what we are waiting for, for from the coverage. Uh, uh, the here are some figures that, very, uh, that are very important for us. But uh, last uh, but not least, we are following the slogan, uh, positively proud. That is uh, what we are trying to, to reach in our activity. Uh, we are trying to remind uh, the great audience that our country uh, has the remarkable Olympic uh, history and traditions. We have more than uh, 600 Olympic uh, champions living in, in our country. Um, uh, and um, uh, we, when we uh, studied the, the, uh, the job of our colleagues in, in London uh, last year uh, during the, the Olympic Games, uh, we were uh, pleased by, by their approach, working with this uh, uh, slogan to be positive and to be proud of, of, of the nation. Uh, they, they managed to, uh, uh, they managed to, to, to create an atmosphere, a very positive atmosphere, ju uh, not, not just for the guests of, of, of the Olympic Games, but also for, for uh, their own nation. So, and uh, when the, the fourth, fifth, uh, or sixth uh, place uh, in, in the competition uh, was or taken as a, as a success, if, if, a, if the athlete really uh, uh, showed a, 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 f uh, a, a will to, to, to win and to, to, to make the, the country proud, that was a really impressive job of, of uh, British media and, and first of all uh, BBC and, and the press association uh, that was a uh, host um, agency for, 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 the, for the games. And that I, I think is that was a good example that we will follow and maybe will be in, uh, uh, maybe will be better in some, in some way. We'll see. And uh, now I see the, the yellow card and uh, let me finish with that and I'll be ready to, to answer your questions later in the panel. Thank you very much. Our thanks to Mr. Tugarin for this presentation of the Russian perspective of the, the preparations. Of course, apropos the torture relay, perhaps this is the moment where I should file a protest. You know, my home team, Washington Capitals, they lost the first game of the season because Alexander Ovechkin, he was uh, supposedly more needed to start out a torture relay in, uh, in, in Greece. Anyway, okay, f perhaps it comes out even over the season. So, our next speaker, the final uh, one of the panel, is Jean-Paul Marteau from Belgium. Starting a, a, a long distinguished uh, career as a journalist in his country, w was the 
uh, responsible for the editorial pages of uh, prominent newspaper Le Soir, but has gradually moved, although he still does his uh, columns, has gradually moved more into teaching and journalists and also to writing books. But one of the reasons why we are very happy to have him here is that he has a focus in a couple of areas that we fit, think fit particularly well with this topic, namely the topic of the freedom of the press and also more br broadly in, uh, human rights and perhaps how those two intersect press coverage of human rights violations. So with those words, uh, Jean-Paul, welcome up. Good afternoon, Destro. Full disclosure, I'm a senior advisor for the Committee of Tech Journalist and I'm the vice chair of the uh, Europe and Central Asia Division of Human Rights Watch, besides being still a journalist. Sports mega events uh, are not new. At first, I will focus on general terms on mega events and media restrictions and focus on Sochi and then back to the general lessons can we can draw from this equation of, to of today. Sports mega events are not new. Mega and media restrictions are not new either. Th the difference between uh, the past and today might be, should be, that journalists increasingly refuse to be herded, prodded, and force fed with pre masticated and sanitized information, and would agree with this famous sentence pronounced by Lord Northcliffe that information is something that someone wants to hide, all the rest is publicity. The difference might also be the journalist have thought twice about former sports media events where silence in the face of attacks against local colleagues compromised the integrity and honor of journalism, which I guess we all agree is a profession premised not only on our own self-serving use of press freedom, but on our commitment to defend it for everyone everywhere. As Columbia University president and CPJ board member Lee Bollinger said, in our globalized world, censorship anywhere is censorship everywhere. The coverage of sports mega events is constrained by private as well as state actors. Let's start with a quick reminder on private actors. CPJ has not really worked on these private restrictions, but professional organizations have protested attempts by global sports organizations eager to protect their commercial rights to impose restrictions on media coverage of media events. For instance, in 2005, when FIFA issued media guidelines limiting the right of non-rights holding media to publish World Cup pictures on their websites, Tim Balding, the executive director of the World Association of Newspapers, so the, the published the, the World Organization of uh, Newspaper Owners, said these conditions are an infringement on free access to information. This a coalition of news media that has been set up, the News Media Coalition, precisely to counter the increasing privatization of the public space orchestrated by mega events organizers. This coalition, which includes news media and professional groups, strive to fight the specific threat to legitimate editorial press and publishing freedoms from the controls placed on news gathering and news distribution practices by the organizers of major events of public interest. In sports, of course, but also in the worlds of show business, fashion, concerts, etc. Freedom of the press belongs to the one who owns one press. Famously said New Yorker press critic A.J. Liebling. Freedom of the press today increasingly belongs to the one who owns one mega event. The privatization of such public spaces and moments raise issues of press freedom if it means selectively filtering out reporters, discriminating on the right to report or publish, establishing binding and sometimes draconian media and social media guidelines and eventually leaving the space and the timing of the event under the near complete control of the PR and spin doctors of the games. State censors are not out of work either. The privatization of censorship has not substituted good old censorship, state censorship. This well-established tradition is all the more topical since as Freedom House, 
a New York-based human, right, human rights organization recently stated, dictators continue to score in international sporting events. Many of recent sports mega events have taken place in dubious countries. The African Cup of Nations in Equatorial Guinea, the Formula One race Grand Prix in Bahrain, and many of the next ones will, be, will also be hosted by rights abusive regimes from the 2015 European Games in Azerbaijan to the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. This fact inevitably leads us back on the well-traveled debate on how to report, under what conditions, with what kinds of challenges in countries that do not happily flash the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on the stadium's scoreboards. Of course, there is the issue of security. All governments, uh, authoritarian or democratic, are committed to assure the success and the safety of the games. They, de they dedicate a lot of resources to provide security to the players and the spectators, and no one in the press will object to these measures that are legitimately aimed at forestalling terrorist attacks or acts of hooliganism. Governments, however, tend to maximize the security preparation at the price often of more restrictions on citizens' freedoms and civil rights than are necessary for effective prevention. Human rights groups and press freedom groups have bitterly learned that they can't expect host governments to suddenly be graced by the Olympic spirit and turn the games into a magical powder that will improve their human rights and press freedom record. The spotlight effect that was mentioned this morning has not been working very well. Arch Puddington, someone, uh, a researcher for Freedom House, even says that sports events are being used by government to silence critics instead of improving uh, the, the fate of, of human rights or, or press freedom. And as it was already mentioned in the, in the previous presentation by Andreas, that many human rights organizations are convinced that the Olympic Games, in the case of Beijing, for instance, in fact, improving human rights did, in, did in fact worsen the situation of human rights. But at least, could these events offer a temporary moment and a gated space for some respite from censorship? Both private and state censors convert host cities into artificial, uh, artificial enclaves, into cities of exception, as written last year by the Brazilian Coalition of Local Communities for a People's World Cup and Olympics, and I quote them, decrees, provisional measures, and pieces of legislation are passed, as well as a tangled collection of low-level legislation and ordinances that create a system of institutionalized exception, end of quote. This exceptionalism, I might even say this exemptionalism, would of course be more palatable if host nations would lift restrictions on freedoms at least in the host city and during the period of the games. It did not happen in China. During the Beijing Olympics, for instance, more than 60 incidents of reporting interference were reported, including several cases where foreign journalists were physically harassed. It didn't happen in Bahrain either. Is it going to happen in Sochi? During Will, will journalists be allowed or even able to report freely and roam around in order to carry out specific assignments that respond to their agenda and not necessary to the PR plan of the IOC, the sponsors and the Russian government? The IOC and the Russian authorities have promised that press freedom will be upheld and journalists will be free to report, that the event will take place, to quote President Putin, in a normal, business-like, and festive manner. We will not prejudge, but allow me a few dissonant notes. Allow me to raise some concerns. First of all, in August uh, 19, in a decree, the Russian authorities have made it clear that they will cordon off Sochi to prevent terrorist attacks rather violence, a scenario, by the way, heightened by real threats issued by radical Islamist groups. But these measures will impose restrictions and prohibitions on freedom of assembly of movement that might also be meant to exclude legitimate dissent at the risk of also excluding mainstream reporting or 
uh, on legitimate stories. The question also of uh, su uh, su surveillance is also another, another uh, issue during the game, the second point that I want to raise. During the game, the press corps will be under high surveillance, not only, of course, by the National Security Agency, as Edward, S Edward Snowden would tell us, but also by the FSB. According to Andrei Sa uh, Soldatov and Irina Borogan, two investigative journalists, two Russian investigative journalists specialized in the Russian intelligence services, the FSB has made sure that it, it can peep on anyone and listen to everyone in Sochi. The allegedly very efficient SOM surveillance technology with deep packet inspection technology has been fitted to all the systems handling the traffic from and into Sochi. And then there is the question of the more general condition of press freedom in Russia. Russia doesn't stand in a uh, very high position when it comes to all the indexes of press freedom groups. Uh, it's number 148 on the Reporters Without Borders uh, index of World Press Freedom. It's 176 on the index of Press Freedom Freedom House. Uh, it's number four uh, on our own CPJ index on the number of journalists that have been killed since 1992. Since 1992, 56 journalists have been killed in Russia and there's re a very high level of impunity. Around 90% of the cases have not uh, been solved. According also to most, to all press freedom groups, freedom of expression and press freedom have even backtracked recently in Russia. These groups mention in particular a series of measures like the recriminalization of libel, which has been uh, lifted by President Medvedev at the time, the prohibition of uh, gay propaganda, which has been an issue which has received a lot of, lot of attention, a new law as well on high treason that might be applied to Russian, especially Russian NGOs cooperating, quote unquote, with foreign media, and a, ch a chilling crackdown on civil society through the foreign agent law. A number of more specific measures focused on the Olympics have also tightened the screws even further. As a recent Human Rights Watch report uh, said, some established media and numerous online news and social media outlets do publish stories that are critical of preparations for the Olympics. And the international media have been able to report on Sochi, its delays, its costs, uh, its labor abuses, and more generally the, the political context. But many, would I say most of, of the Russian media, national and local media outlets have been silent or very passive about issues surrounding the buildings of the Olympic city in Sochi and the preparations of the game, including the eviction of residents and the failure to adequately compensate them, the exploitation of migrant workers, it was mentioned in the, par in the previous session, adverse environmental repercussions for Sochi residents related to the building of the Olympic city, etc., etc. Also as documented in a report that we are preparing at the Committee to Protect Journalists that I have uh, received a draft and will be published in a few weeks from now, uh, editors and media owners appear to have discouraged their reporters from writing stories critical of the Olympic preparations Self-censorship has spread in both Sochi and Moscow-based media in order to, do to avoid troubles. Jaywalking journalists and media outlets have paid a price. Such price has included administrative harassment, criminal prosecution for alleged law violations, office searches and confiscation of computers, disabling denials of service attacks against critical websites, and some journalists also have been taken off the Sochi story. The niche of independent reporting has been partly filled by environmental activists and human rights defenders active in the region. Each of these activists and defenders have been using their personal blogs on Russian blogging platforms on YouTube, as well as on social networking sites such as Facebook to blast out information, information on dispatches about the real situation in Sochi and to alert the society about the issues surrounding the, Olympi the Olympic preparation. These bloggers have de facto taken over to some extent the role of journalists and filled out the informational vacuum. The trouble, one blogger told CPJ in our forthcoming report, is that even though we send our dispatches, 
the mainstream media keep silent. They don't pick up our messages, and if they do, they do that only when the problem becomes so gigantic that it crosses the Russian borders, such as when Human Rights Watch issued a big report on the situation with migrant workers in Sochi. Now let's go back to the general picture of our media restrictions in sports or other mega events. Let us be candid. Many journalists, should I say some journalists, are mainly concerned with the conditions related to their nar narrowly defined sports assignments. For them, politics should be kept out of the stadium. They will only protest if draconian security measures, excessive surveillance, substandard telecommunications and unfair access to the sites hamper their own reporting. If the logistics is perfect and the officials official escorts polite and helpful, they will remain in the bubble on the right side of the tracks and close their eyes to any other news that might distract them from their sports assignment. This is what many journalists did during the 1917 World Cup in Argentina. This is what they did, many of them, during the 2008 Beijing Olympics. But if I ask you to be candid, you can do also big headed. Sports mega events are a major test of journalist integrity and independence in a globalized world. Everyone has a choice as a journalist, but international journalists have a role and, and have an impact. And the local civil society, as well as the local media who are under pressure, rely on the international media to take the lead and break the stories that I shackled to cover. Everyone as a journalist has a choice. I just will end my speech by quoting a famous US dissident journalist, Easy uh, Stone, who said, all governments lie and disaster waits for governments whose officials smoke the same hashish they, they give out to their own people. Sports mega events are definitely political events, and journalism will be ill-served if reporters would smoke the same hash that the officials give out. I trust journalists, at least all those journalists that made the trip to Aarhus despite the storm, that they are candid and pig-headed, and that they will play the game, their game, by following their own rules and not the ones imposed by private and state censors. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jean-Paul Marteau, not just for covering one of the many important areas of concern when we look ahead to the Sochi Olympics, but also given that we are not sitting here just passively or in a theoretical way listening to these issues. Many of you here in the room are journalists who, of course, got a valuable and, and in, uh, in a relevant reminder from uh, uh, our speaker that indeed it now is a matter also then for those of you who are involved in reporting from Sochi to follow through and not just sit here and worry on and speculate before the event, but actually follow up on what will happen during the event. With that, I'm leaving the floor open for questions from the audience to our panel members and for that matter if they among themselves have any any uh, comments or dialogue uh, after their presentations, but in the first instance, I want to see who, Deborah in the back, uh, can we get a microphone over? Hello, um, my name is Deborah Unger, I'm with Transparency International, and my question is directed at Alexei Konov. You spoke about the G20 anti-corruption action plan. You spoke about Russia's commitment to putting sports and anti-corruption on that agenda. And as we heard from Jean-Paul Matos, 
there are many laws now in Russia that restrict civil society from participating in this. And yet, in the Anti-Corruption Action Plan, the G20, they support the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which specifically calls on civil society to play a strong role in fighting corruption. My question is, what is your comment on that? And for example, we have a chapter in Russia, TI Russia, that works on corruption. And you even mentioned Transparency International, and yet they are in court now facing these laws. Yeah, thank you for your question. Unfortunately, Lena Panfilba from the Russian Transparency International chapter was not able to, to be here. I know her very well for many years. Yes, I know about all the restrictions put on the NGOs in Russia now. And uh, in fact, uh, the problem here is that, um, the first problem is that uh, I can't comment on this in my official capacity because it's beyond actually my, uh, uh, beyond my prerogative actually because I'm responsible for anti-corruption in G20 and not for the NGO legislation in Russia. Uh, from our side, from the side of the uh, Russian presidency in G20 and from the anti-corruption working group, we did our best this year to involve the civil society in the process. For example, for the first time actually in the G20 process, we invited the civil society organizations to take part in the meetings of the ACWG. And actually the Transparency International was the only organization that took part in these meetings with uh, Uget Labelle, the Chief of Transparency International. She was present in all the meetings except for the last one. There was also representative from Transparency International, International but not her. And we also uh, received the recommendations from the civil society. So there are different, you know, there are different groups and different people involved in this process. Some of them are for this uh, anti NGO legislation, some are against it. From our side, we try to, to fulfill the Anti-Corruption Convention Against Corruption and try to involve uh, the civil society in this, in this dialogue. You invite organizations to sit at your table and then you prosecute them the next week in the courts. That doesn't sound very um, no, logical. Uh, we do not prosecute anyone. There are hearings. I, 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 there I are mentioned hearings. it, yeah. Different groups, different people, uh, different, you know, ideas and different intentions. People who were in the G20 this year, they do not prosecute the Russian NGOs. So it is a kind of paradox. And there is now maybe kind of, I don't know how to say, the general line, yeah, with regard to the NGOs, because, for example, the uh, representatives of Transparency International, uh, of the Russian chapter of Transparency International, they are not only involved in the G20 process, for example, but they were at least involved, for example, in the President's Council on Anti-Corruption. There is a, an Anti-Corruption Council here in Russia, and they were involved in it. And some of the uh, representatives of the NGOs who are also in court now they were also involved in this President's Council. So it's a kind of paradox, yes. They are in the President's Council, but they are at the same time in court. This is life. <laughs> okay. Yes, it is. It is. It is now. Uh, Leviathan Hendricks from the Federation of Gay Games. Um, I, I'm doing a presentation tomorrow about Pride House International. Is um, It'll be the first session, in the, uh, breakout session in this room, and I would love if, especially the gentleman from Russia, or if you could all attend it, it would be fantastic. Um, on Monday, uh, President Putin said that um, We'll do everything to make sure that athletes, fans, and guests feel comfortable at the Olympic Games, regardless of their ethnicity, race, or sexual orientation. I would like to underline that, end quote. Um, I, I just wonder from, from an outsider who's not as familiar with the political workings of Russia or, or, or Putin's influence, if you could comment on how much 
we can take him at face value that 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 will actually be the experience how much control he has over um and if if you feel that um that um lgbt athletes or fans might be at risk uh of violence from um russian citizens thank you And, and I love the idea of a global alliance for integrity in sports. Um, I, I would submit that corrupt that there are a lot of things to anti-corruption in sport and and, um, and uh, anti anti-gay propaganda might be one of them. I love if you could actually pronounce it. Global alliance for in integrity in sports. I'm going to call it gay is. I think that's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So who would want to take this on again, recognizing that you're not speaking officially on behalf of any ministry or government agency, but nevertheless, Alexei or Dmitry, would you venture in a response? Oh. I will come. I'm not press secretary of Mr. Putin. I, I guess Mr. Peskov, who is the press secretary, will be very hurt if he gets to know that I'm, I'm wor wor making his job. But uh, anyway, I... Uh, I saw uh, the uh, uh, the program on Danish TV today in the morning about the, this uh, event in, in Sochi where Mr. Putin uh, uh, met uh, the, the new president of IOC and he commented uh, and you quoted right uh, but uh, I'd like to uh, to separate the, the matter uh, uh, we are talking about uh, about the Olympic Games and the conditions of, of the athletes and the guests of the games when they come to to, uh, to perform there and to be to be the spectators and to be the guests, it's uh, one thing. And and uh, I'm absolutely sure that the conditions for everybody will be equal for for uh, ev uh, all of the guests of the Olympic Games. The other thing is uh, uh, concerning the the prom promotion, the propaganda, as we used to say, propaganda of the uh, so some, uh, uh, so to say, non-traditional for Russia activities, uh, especially among the, the uh, young people, the teenagers and the kids. It's uh, what's exactly the, the law concerning uh, about. And uh, if we separate these two, two, two matters, so it will be easy to, 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 uh, to understand that if people are not uh, uh, not uh, making propaganda among the the, the, uh, the kids in Sochi, I, I don't think it will be something li like that. So it's it's no no reason to, to discuss uh, the these uh, uh, these uh, issues so so uh, uh, to pay so much attention to it. I, I'm absolutely sure that that it if uh, if it will not be. If if the problem will not be uh, uh, raised in in uh, uh, how to say in in, um, in in this strong way, uh, it's uh, we have no we I see no reason uh, to 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 uh, to use it in 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 connection to to Sochi Games. So. I don't think that that is uh, the <laughs> in the in, in the game, uh, Olympic Games in, in Sochi. Uh, I've heard your your uh, presentation yesterday, and so uh, I understand that um, it's it's a very special, uh, very special activity and a very special case for for your organization. And it's difficult to f to find the uh, common language with the IOC and Sport Accord and so on, so on. So you understand when the so many uh, big players on the field. It's uh, sometimes it's it's difficult to, to find the common language. Uh, but uh, as I said, I uh, 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 I guess Mr. Putin said clearly enough about the the uh, this matter. It's I don't think it will be any any problems for anybody. Andreas, you want to try? Yeah, to I have a comment, not to the last question, but to the Transparency International uh, uh, and uh, on um, 
on prosecution because you don't have to prosecute all the uh, if people don't uh, dare to speak out. Uh, in our study uh, from the Beijing Olympics, uh, no, uh, no, uh, no one of the organizations they went to Beijing because they could not get in because they had uh, done too much harm to the, the, the Chinese government. Their strategy towards the Sochi Olympics was not to go to uh, Russia, maybe, but to cooperate with Russian organizations. I know that, for instance, the, uh, the Norwegian Union of Journalists, they wanted to cooperate with Russian journalists to uh, report on different issues from, uh, from uh, Russia. They gave up because nobody wanted to cooperate with them or uh, go join them in uh, this project. So it's not only a matter of prosecution, it's uh, a matter of daring to stand up for your rights. So <laughs> that is one case. Uh, maybe other organizations are more um, successful uh, with cooperation with Russian organization. But uh, that is one example that uh, if you, if you uh, say that you will prosecute people, they will not stand up. Mm. We have several uh, first over here on the side. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Jesper Frikas Larsen, NOC of Denmark. And it is a question for Andreas, rather a triple question. Uh, firstly, Andreas, you, you mentioned uh, that athletes particularly Norwegian, but maybe other countries at this as well, can uh, expect pressure from NGOs uh, before the Sochi Games, in the, in the three months to come before the Games. Uh, first part of the question is what, what kind of pressure do you expect that uh, the athletes will be put under? Uh, second part of the question is, uh, in your personal opinion, do you think that it is uh, fair that athletes who have been preparing maybe and training for 10 years and stand just before the highlight of their sporting career should have these uh, preparations, final preparations uh, disturbed by, by uh, um, NGOs to, to uh, act politically. And thirdly, if this happens, what would be your advice for, for uh, the athletes uh, in Norwegian and, and abroad? Thank you. Uh, there has already been uh, quite a lot of pressure on Norwegian athletes. Uh, for instance, in the, the issue on the anti-gay laws. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, the Norwegian sports, their, uh, their uh, uh, campaign against homophobia is very well known. And uh, they have told all the athletes uh, to speak up their opinion on this issue without being punished. So the uh, uh, pressure put on Norwegian athletes now is on what do they mean about the situation in Russia. Uh, and second, uh, I think they should go and participate in Russia. They are prepared for a long time, but they should be free to express their opinion. And also the federation, uh, the, na the National Olympic Committee, should be open about the si society they are entering. But the, uh, we have already had two, three athletes uh, who will uh, participate in the Olympics who had uh, who has said that they will use this uh, uh, rainbow sing, uh, sign and things like that and stand up for the rights of the gay people and other issues. And uh, nobody has said that they will be punished for that. Uh, I don't know <laughs> what the Russian government will do, but, but I, hope they, uh, uh, I hope they will stay away. Uh, and my advice to athletes and other people is that do what you are best at, but uh, be open about what, what you think about things and uh, try to gather some knowledge about uh, the society you are um, uh, entering or going to. I don't know if that was a good qu uh, answer, but triple answer. I think I recognize that Jens back there had or if it was you, or you just trying to climb the wall again, or no? Okay, <laughs> that's more reassuring. Um, yes, I would like to, uh, to ask, we have heard uh, recently that the cost of the Sochi Olympics will be around uh, 50 billion US dollars. Um, allegedly, uh, or, or presumably, uh, the 
most expensive Olympics ever, something that has come quite as a surprise because we thought, many of us, that we would never experience in a lifetime uh, something more expensive than Beijing. So there is also an additional information attached to this figure that a lot of this money uh, may uh, have gone lost in corruption and that is the reason for the spiraling costs. So uh, my question to our Russian guest is, has this uh, uh, fact, are you partly are you recognizing this, uh, these figures more or less? And has it inspired uh, your uh, journalism or respectively your anti-corruption work? Is this a factor that, that influences the way you do your respective works? Thank you. Uh. Thank you. Uh, regarding the numbers, uh, I, I can't say if I recognize the numbers because I'm not actually aware of the cost of the Sochi Olympics. And uh, frankly speaking, I don't even know the number you've just mentioned. Uh, I fully understand that we have a lot of corruption and a lot of cases of misallocation of resources, and some of them are very well known now. Some people have been already prosecuted, and some people are now hiding in London, for example. And we know that and some of them were fired, and we know that uh, they spent uh, some money, at least some money, I guess, were spent not uh, properly, I would say that. <laughs> uh, so, of course, uh, big numbers and big costs are in a very big part uh, because of corruption and misallocation of resources. I don't know w which reason is most important here, the reason that uh, Sochi is quite an unusual place for having the Winter Olympics. And it's, it was uh, understandable from the very beginning that it will be a very expensive project because the place is so unusual. Uh, I don't think that corruption is the main reason of big numbers, but it's, of course it's one of reasons and of course we, we uh, we should recognize it uh, because even because we know the concrete specific cases which are uh, which have been reported now uh, regarding the anti-corruption activities uh, uh, I, I can't say anything about the journalists because I'm not a journalist myself regarding the anti-corruption activities I think that uh, corruption in Sochi was not a kind of a specific impetus for any anti-corruption initiatives in Russia because it's, you know, it's quite a, there was, no, there was nothing surprising in those cases that we know now about uh, misappropriation, misallocation of resources, about corruption. It was usual corruption in public procurement. We have lots of other cases in lots of other areas, not in Sochi, quite similar to that. So uh, it was not something surprising. We understand that it's kind of um, one or two more cases to the, that add to the general picture. Uh, but uh, for, uh, it was, of course it was uh, an impetus for certain initiatives and regarding this initiative of Global Alliance and the G20 agenda, it was uh, much easier to put these things into the anti-corruption agenda of the G20 for our presidency because of the, uh, because of Sochi and of corruption problems in Sochi. Yeah. Remember to point here in the third row. Ah, okay. In the meantime, while you're coming up with the microphone, that you can get uh, another uh, added uh, commentary uh, on that, please. I can uh, point out two, two important things. I've been um, uh, part of the, the Sochi bid in the, in the very beginning. And so I know that the figures of um, uh, estimation about the, the, the uh, costs of the uh, Olympic Games in Sochi changed many times. Uh, and that was it. It's part of of the, the of the bid. It's a part of of the business about the Olympic Games. It's it's absolutely normal. Uh, but uh, the, I guess the uh, estimations are very very different today because there are a lot of. Uh, it depends on how you count because the very a big part of money coming from from the uh, from the private uh, companies from the investors and they're part of uh, 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 the money of, of the state budget. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it was a big uh, project about uh, 
developing the developing the region of uh, of Krasnodar and the uh, city of Sochi, uh, and there are a lot of costs that are not uh, that are not directly going to for for the preparation to 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 the games, but the the necessary uh, uh, costs that. Uh, uh that should uh, that w would be done anyway. It's uh, for the infrastructure and for for the uh, uh, to solve many problems of logistics and so on, so on. Because uh, uh, I repeat, it's uh, the the problems that were not directly connected to to the Olympic Games in the beginning, seven uh, seven years ago. But when you try to solve the problems, uh, you see that that you cannot. Uh, solve one problem without solving two other problems, and that's that's why uh, the the uh, uh, the costs they they grew, and and the, the of course it's it's a tremendous uh, figure, uh, but uh, the second part of your question, uh, this uh, uh, process is discussed by Russian media very openly. And there are a lot of bloggers and a lot of uh, media who, who are discussing the the, uh, the costs and uh, the corruption uh, uh, cases and the the uh, efficiency uh, of the of the uh, work that was done and so on and so on and uh, I see the very positive thing in that the problem is is uh, discussed so openly on on TV on uh, in in social uh, networks in media and, and, and so on. So th it's not kind of closed problem for, for, for the experts. It's, it's, a, it's a matter for, for national discussion. Well, I, I, although I hear some stomachs growling and some people are beginning to look at our watches, we already have two of <laughs> colleagues here with microphones in hand, so they will get their chance and uh, I'll start I'll up here. I'll do it quick. Uh, I'm Johnny from the Danish School of Media and Journalism. My question is for you, Mr. Tuganin. Um, as a Russian journalist, uh, what do you make of the concerns your colleague, uh, besides you, Sean Paul Matos, uh, raised in his uh, presentation? Mm, uh, first of all, I'm not a journalist. I'm a bureaucrat. Mm. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm organizing the work of, of, uh, of uh, our, our reporters in the agency. But what exactly, uh, especially you mean? Wha what problems about the, the uh about the safety of, of Sa journalists in, in, in Russia? <laughs> including to report. Including to report. Yeah, I understand. But safety in in common or just in in the in the in just just a g general comment on on the presentation made by uh, Mr. Matos. So you make uh, you want me to to make a. Uh, a comment on, on the whole uh, report of, of my colleague. Yeah, wh what, what's your opinion on that? Do you uh, think journalists will be free to wander around and uh, do their job? Uh, they will be free in, in the, uh, due to all the rules that International Olympic Committee uh, 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 see. And, and there, there are many rules and, and there are many restrictions both for, for uh, national and international media uh, that are discussed. What, what, what we do uh, is uh, we're, we're studying all the restriction, restrictions that are made by the International Olympic Committee because it's the, the Olympic Games, it's the, the, uh, the event provided by, first of all, by the International Olympic Committee. And there are a lot of uh, things that are uh, strictly prohibited by, by uh, International Olympic Committee, like uh, you, you maybe know sim simple things like if you you uh, a reporter with the E accreditation, you cannot uh, take a, a video uh, on 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 the arena, or uh, if you are uh, you if you have another kind of accreditation. You cannot make the, the uh, interview in the mixed zone, and so so so. Uh, otherwise, I don't know. Uh, I don't see the the restrictions. If journalists ca cannot go walk the uh, streets of Sochi or, or or what, or meet the people they want to meet, I don't think it it will be a, a problem. I think we'll have to move on to the final. 
Yes, uh, my name is Hannah Brevik. I'm from Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. And I'm really looking forward to the Sochi Games. I love the winter sports, and uh, Norway has a fair chance of several medals, and so, uh, so is Russia. And I'm sure you have uh, a very nice broadcast of the, uh, the, of the, the whole games. Um, as, as you have heard, we have a lot of critical issues also uh, regarding the Sochi Olympics. How, how, uh, how do you define uh, uh, the problematic uh, uh, issues regarding these Olympics? For instance, the price, uh, the total price, cost of the Olympics, uh, pollution, environmental issues, uh, human rights issues. Uh, is this uh, a concern uh, for your journalists and how do you deal with it? And how do you make articles about this in uh, coming up to the Sochi Olympics in February? It's it's a question for a big report. You know, <laughs> I don't don't think I'll manage to, to answer in, in two two sentences. So uh, what we do, we are trying to, to reflect all the the matters and the issues uh, uh, about the, the Sochi Games and all the important things. So we are uh, we are ma making interviews and we are uh, talking to experts and we are we are getting comments and, and uh, I don't. Uh, ever uh, heard, ever heard about any restriction uh, fr from the authorities about our activity? So it's. Uh, but uh, the other thing uh, I I tried to, to uh, the other idea I tried to to, uh, to tell you in my in my presentation, we're really trying to 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 be positively, not not just positively, but po positively proud about our country who got the, the unique opportunity of the, of the Olympic Games. And uh, uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't mean that, that we, are, we are, uh, do not see the problems uh, and only uh, trying to, to, to raise the, the positive things. But uh, we are trying to be constructive, no, not destructive in, in our activity. Uh, that's uh, and uh, the thing I told you about the the inviting of the Russian media and the Russian regional media for the dialogue and for the cooperation. I guess it's uh, the right way to to uh, to work together. So uh, the the only thing <laughs> that I will say, say in conclusion, uh, we don't feel we uh, uh, journalists and our colleagues we don't feel the restrictions, the, the censorship or something like that in, in, in uh, uh, delivering the, the information to, to the audience. So perhaps uh, if uh, I think we have to sort of draw the line there in terms of additional questions, but uh, pu uh, pulling together a couple of comments on this theme, it seems that a lot of them have to do with if, if you are a critical or uh, investigating journalist, do you, fi do you find sources to who are willing to, to talk with you and provide you with information? And what risks uh, do you feel you are taking if you are, are asking those questions and then publishing the, uh, the, the answers? So that may be more the inhibition than any formal restrictions to, uh, that, that are in place. But with that, I think we need to d draw the line. Unfortunately, we are w uh, well over time and I'd like to thank our panel members in, in to some extent as I think all of you have recognized that our two Russian uh, panel members come here in their particular capacities and of course obviously have to be somewhat cautious about b speaking beyond their mandate but I think they have made an, a good effort to be helpful in response to uh, our questions anyway. And I ask that we give all of them a nice round of applause and thank them for their contributions here today.